You are listening to The Opium Wars, Part 4, The Summer Palace. This episode is audio only. Almost exactly one year after the British and French had been defeated by the Chinese at the Dagu forts, in July 1860, a small Anglo-French task force arrived once more off the forts. The official reason was to enforce trade agreements made between the British, French and Chinese at the 1858 Treaty of Tianjin, including regularising the opium trade. Instead of attempting to force the well-fortified High River as they had in 1859 with such disastrous consequences, the Allies decided instead to land a small number of well-trained troops and storm one fort to obtain a lodgment in the Chinese position. The Chinese had greatly expanded the number of forts at Dagu, and by 1860 they numbered 26, armed with 45 artillery pieces. This was a mistake, for the 5,000-strong Chinese garrison was widely dispersed, and each fort was neither strongly garrisoned nor well-equipped with guns. Leading the British force of 2,000 men was Lieutenant General Sir James Hope Grant, while Lieutenant General Charles Cousin Montauban commanded the 200 French troops. Grant had distinguished himself in China in 1842 during the First Opium War, particularly at the Battle of Chinkiang. He had later played a leading part in suppressing the Indian mutiny and was knighted for his services. Instead of sailors and Royal Marines, the British chose to use regular army formations at Dagu drawn from the 31st Huntingdonshire Regiment, the Queen's 2nd Royal Regiment of Foot and the 44th East Essex Regiment of Foot. On the 30th of July, Brigadier General Sutton's brigade landed at Pei Tung Lo, close to the Dagu forts. A fort reconnaissance was launched by the Queen's, from which two men were wounded by Chinese fire from one of the forts. The main assault was made on the 12th of August, the assaulting force once again being forced to cross the tidal mud that covered the approaches to the forts. As General Grant remarked, it is simply a matter of the degree of filth our men must traverse. Very heavy fighting once more erupted as the Anglo-French force crossed the open ground, smashed through Chinese trench lines and spiked bamboo palisades, and eventually closed in on the first fort. An attempt was made to smash in the main door, but this proved to be impossible. Two officers and an enlisted man then made a Herculean effort to clamber through an open gun embrasure, in the process taking on more than a hundred Chinese soldiers virtually single-handed. Lieutenant Robert Rogers, a 25-year-old from Dublin, serving with the 44th Foot, accompanied by Private John McDougall from the same regiment, and Lieutenant Edmund Lennon, 67th Regiment, later the Royal Hampshire Regiment, had swum several ditches under fire before they entered the North Fort, fighting their way over a parapet with sword and bayonet. All three men were awarded the Victoria Cross. The fort was taken, the Allied troops rested and reorganised themselves within its walls. Over the following two weeks, the Anglo-French force went on to capture all 26 forts. Compared with the debacle of the previous year, this battle of the Dagu forts was a major Anglo-French victory and indicated that the Chinese might not be militarily capable of repeating their 1859 performance. British casualties amounted to 14 killed and 48 wounded. French casualties are unknown. The Chinese lost about 100 killed, 300 wounded, and 2,100 taken prisoner. The way to Peking was now open. The Qing army, led by General Sunga Rinchen, made two final efforts to halt the barbarian army before it reached the Forbidden City. Grant and Cousin Montauban's army had occupied Tianjin and had been reinforced, so that it numbered 10,000 men. The force had progressed slowly towards Peking through the horrendously hot summer. On the 14th of September 1860, General Cousin Montauban and his deputy, Baron Gros, joined General Grant and the British High Commissioner to China, Lord Elgin, a few dozen miles from Peking. On the 16th, it was agreed that the British and French forces would resume the advance together. Two days later, Harry Parks and Henry Locke, accompanied by a small escort of British, Indian and French troops, 
preceded the main advance with the intention of opening peace negotiations with the Chinese leadership. They rode under a white flag of truce, but they were captured by Chinese forces near Tongzhou and taken straight to Peking. Arraigned before the Board of Punishments, the party was imprisoned and tortured. Parks, Locke and 14 others were to be released after the Chinese defeat, but the Chinese had inflicted the torture of slow slicing to 20 of the party, where limbs were amputated and tied off to increase the victims' sufferings. These 20 soldiers died horribly, and when their bodies were discovered, they were virtually unrecognisable. This event was to cause immense anger among the British and French, for diplomatic envoys travelling under a flag of truce should have been respected, and the incident fueled strong anti-Chinese sentiment at all levels of the military command, and stirred calls for swift and terrible revenge. A British reconnaissance force that blundered into a huge Chinese army the day after the kidnappings of Parks and his party was shocked by the fates of their countrymen and by the size of the Chinese forces opposing them. Quote, we were surprised to see a very large body of Tartar cavalry, numerous guns and masses of infantry drawn up as if intending to dispute our further passage, wrote St. John Foley, commissioner to the French headquarters, in a letter to British Foreign Secretary Lord John Russell. On the 18th of September 1860, General Sunger met the Anglo-French force at the small village of Zhang Jawan, close to the Peking suburb of Tongzhou. 30,000 Chinese troops attempted to defeat the Allies, but the modern equipment, superior tactics and better leadership of the Anglo-French force hopelessly outclassed them. The French turned the Chinese left flank, while the British and Indian forces attacked their front. Quote, the movement succeeded admirably, the Tatars being completely routed with great loss, the French killing great numbers in the village on the left, the cavalry cutting them up, as they were driven out onto the plain beyond. Unquote. The Chinese army retreated, leaving 1,500 men behind dead on the battlefield. British and French casualties were ludicrously small. Just 20 British and 15 French soldiers had been killed. The British remained extremely concerned for the safety of the Parks Party. Quote, Great anxiety prevails respecting the fate of Mr. Park's officers and men who still remain in the hands of the Chinese, wrote Foley. The generals-in-chief have written to threaten the capture of Peking should they be murdered or ill-treated, unquote. Three days later, General Sunger tried to stop the Anglo-French force again, this time within Peking at the Balachau or Eight Mile Bridge that was linked to the famed Summer Palace. The battle was a farce. The cream of the Qing army, primarily its fabled Mongolian cavalry, threw themselves in suicidal charges against the French and British lines, and they were cut down in huge numbers. Quote, the enemy met us in the open, their force composed of many thousand cavalry, large masses of infantry and numerous guns. The Tartar cavalry charged up to within a hundred yards of the British guns and infantry, the fire from which drove them back. On the French left, the British King's Dragoon Guards arrived just in time to charge and cut up a great number of them. The enemy, after much resistance, was gradually driven back to the canal, our artillery causing them great loss. Unquote. The Chinese last stand was at Balakao Bridge. After having ten guns placed there, the French 12-pound guns soon silenced them, and the whole Tartar army retired towards Pekin, leaving their camps in our possession, recalled Grant. Grant's troops were heavily engaged on the left and succeeded in inflicting great loss upon the enemy. Swords and lances were no match for rifles and modern artillery. The Chinese lost over 1,200 men before breaking and fleeing into Peking. Allied casualties amounted to just two British killed and 29 wounded, while the French lost three killed and 18 wounded. Tongzhou is only 12 miles from the Forbidden City. Chinese resistance was at an end, but what followed was one of the greatest acts of cultural vandalism in modern history, and the shameful denouement to a shameful war. On the 22nd of September, the Anglo-French commanders received letters from the Chinese authorities suggesting a parley. Peking lay at the Allies' mercy. 
the 6th of October, British and French troops began entering the imperial capital. The Xianfeng Emperor fled from the Forbidden City, leaving his younger brother, Prince Gong, to negotiate with the barbarians. Large-scale looting by Allied soldiers broke out almost immediately as the Summer Palace and Old Summer Palace were each occupied. The Summer Palace, an imperial playground closed to ordinary Chinese, consisted of a complex of buildings, gardens and lakes around the 200-foot-high Longevity Hill. The Old Summer Palace, or Gardens of Perfect Brightness, was an ancient 860-acre private sanctuary containing many masterpieces of Chinese art. On the 18th of October, Lord Elgin, infuriated by the Chinese torture and murder of members of Harry Park's truce party, ordered that the Old Summer Palace be razed to the ground in revenge. Elgin believed that destroying one of the imperial family's more significant cultural artefacts would serve as a warning to the Chinese to desist from using kidnapping as a bargaining tool. It was an immense job, and it took 3,500 British and Indian troops three days to destroy the complex. And yet, 13 royal buildings survived. The destruction was by no means popular among the troops who were ordered to carry it out, for the palace complex was exquisite. Charles Gordon, who would go on to become one of the British Empire's greatest heroes, was sickened by the destruction. Quote, we went out, and after pillaging it, burned the whole place, destroying in a vandal-like manner most valuable property, which could not be replaced for four millions. We got upward of forty-eight pounds apiece prize money. The local people are very civil, but I think the grandees hate us, as they must, after what we did to the palace, wrote Gordon. You can scarcely imagine the beauty and magnificence of the palace places we burnt. It made one's heart sore to burn them. In fact, these places were so large, and we were so pressed for time, that we could not plunder them carefully. Quantities of gold ornaments were burnt, considered as brass. It was wretchedly demoralising work for an army." Unquote. The contents of the old Summer Palace today grace many private homes and national museums in Britain and France, and the Chinese were able to save many important artefacts overlooked by the foreign troops. Unfortunately, although some of the old Summer Palace escaped the flames in 1860, the rest was to be thoroughly destroyed in 1900, following the conclusion of the Boxer Rebellion, covered in a further episode. Today only scattered ruins and a few small pavilions remain to remind the Chinese of their second terrible defeat at the hands of the barbarians. Elgin had considered destroying the Forbidden City, but he had chosen the old Summer Palace as the least objectionable, as he said, to be flattened. In this, the Russian and French diplomats, Count Ignatiev and Baron Gros, supported Elgin. The Emperor's brother, Prince Gong, signed the Convention of Peking on the 18th of October 1860. Among its many stipulations, the Convention granted Britain, France and Russia the right to establish embassies, known as legations, in Peking, in an area adjacent to the Forbidden City that would soon become known as the Legation Quarter. The Chinese were forced to pay Britain and France an indemnity of 8 million silver tails, and Britain was handed the town of Kowloon, opposite Hong Kong Island, in perpetuity. The opium trade was legalised, and Christians were granted freedom of worship, the right to own property, and the right to evangelise in China. Tianjin was also open to foreign trade. The emperor died soon after, and the Qing dynasty was on its knees, humiliated by a tiny force of barbarian soldiers. This would have great ramifications for the ruling dynasty in the eyes of its people, and lead to the self-strengthening movement, when China attempted, with mixed results, to modernise its economy and armed forces, to avoid further humiliations at the hands of the great powers. China had once been the greatest empire on earth. Now her trade was virtually under the control of foreigners, and her great port cities governed by them. Foreign warships patrolled even her rivers. It was perhaps inevitable that before long, fresh conflicts would arise with the barbarians, and old mistakes would be repeated with devastating consequences for both rulers and ruled. The British were the greatest winners of the two drugs wars that they had fought against China. 
By 1860, Britain controlled Hong Kong and Kowloon and maintained concessions, little slices of trading territory ruled over by British officials and protected by British armed forces in Shanghai, Amoy, Nanking, Canton, Tianjin and many other Chinese cities, both big and small. Protecting these privileged trading enclaves became the primary responsibility of the British armed forces, necessitating the stationing of garrison troops all along the Chinese coast, and the maintenance of a fleet of warships that could be sent to any trouble spot at a moment's notice. But the problem for Britain was the wide dispersal of her armed forces in China, owing to the large number of concessions and the size of the country. This would be cruelly exposed four decades after Prince Gong signed the Convention of Peking when a new and altogether more frightening storm blew up in the north of China that threatened all that the British and the other great powers had spent so many years carefully constructing. And this time the threat came initially not from China's ruling class, but from the poorest sections of Chinese society, from among the peasant farmers and coolies who had nothing to lose by forcing a fight with their European overlords. They took the name Fists of Righteous Harmony, and they intended to drive a fist into the face of every white man in China. Tune in next time for the Boxer Rebellion. Thanks for watching, please subscribe and share, and also visit my video channel, Mark Felton Productions. You can also help to support both of my channels at PayPal and Patreon, details in the description box below.